Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Rob Doubleday, uh, uh, Director of the Centre for Science and Policy. And um, this is a very lovely occasion because it's an occasion um, at which we're celebrating the publication of Jaideep Prabhu's new book. And the, the, the topic is um, about government innovation and uh, what does the future hold for governments? So as I said, how should a government be? The New Levers of State Power, a uh, book by Jaideep Prabhu, and it's, it's great to, to welcome Jaideep. Um, he is the Nehru Professor of Indian Business and Enterprise at the Cambridge Judd Business School. Jaideep is also an Associate Fellow of the Centre for Science and Policy, which is wonderful. And Jaideep has met um, more policy fellows visiting Cambridge on the CSAT programme than any other academic at Cambridge. So Jaideep, um, you're, we're very grateful to you for having done that. And that actually um, is a story, uh, one of the stories behind the book, because I know Jaideep's interest in government and the workings of government has um, part, in part come from his many interactions with CSAT policy fellows. And it's great that so many of you are joining us here um, this, this evening. Um, after a um, brief discussion with Jaideep, we'll open up to Richard Wilson and Claire Moriarty to start the discussion. Uh, I'm sure neither Richard nor Claire needs much of an introduction from me. Uh, Richard Wilson um, was one of the founders of the Center for Science and Policy, uh, former cabinet secretary, as, as you know, as career in the civil service included um, spell in the Department for Energy in the 1970s, permanent secretary of of the Department for Environment and Home Office, um, and Richard um, has been a great uh, supporter of Jai Deep's work as well, particularly with Indian civil servants over the years. Um, and Richard is a is a very valued member of the CSAP Advisory Council, as is Claire Moriarty. So Claire, you're also extremely welcome. Claire, like Richard, an experienced civil servant, having worked in health, justice. Uh, transport and then as, as again many of you know was a permanent secretary in DEFRA and then Department for Exiting the European Union. Well, I think Claire's reputation for supporting innovation in the civil service is well known to civil servants if not more widely and um, currently among other things Claire's chairing the Health Foundation's COVID-19 impact inquiry. So we have two great uh, experienced civil servants to, to kick off discussion. So Jaideep, what a great occasion. Thank you for joining us. So the book, which really builds on your um, research in the business school, looking at how digital transformation has changed the corporate world and how agile startups have, have used digital technologies to disrupt and change the corporate environment. And you've looked at strategies that corporates um, engage in to make sense of this. Uh, this book is a departure because it focuses on governments and what this means for governments. So I suppose the, this, the one question I really want to start with to open the discussion is, you know, this is a hopeful book. You say this, these transformational technologies can, can mean so much for governments, but it also begins with a sense that it's not taken for granted that governments will manage this. And it's almost an existential challenge for governments that, that taking advantage of these digital technologies is, is, an, is, is the open question for government. What, what, uh, what, what do you think is behind the sort of the, the examples where you see governments making a success of this? So first of all, Rob, it's uh, such a pleasure to be here uh, doing this. I want to thank you and all your colleagues at CSAP for organizing this. And I want, all the, I want to thank all the fellows for being on this call. Many of them are fellows of CSAP. Uh, as you said, you know, uh, over the years, I've had great conversations with many of the fellows and really the book uh, to some extent comes out of those conversations. So thank you for that. Now coming to the book, uh, yes. Uh, so, you know, I have this statement quite early on in the book where I say that, you know, if our governments don't use uh, these means, these new technologies, others will. And in fact, I think that's a great place to start. You know, not only will others, they're already using these technologies to great effect. Um, and you see, of course, you know, the digital giants, the so-called FANGs, Facebook, Amazon, Google, Netflix, and Microsoft um, have, uh, in a very short period of time, used these uh, new tools, these new technologies and forms of organization to get immensely powerful. Of course, they have delivered things of value to large numbers of people, 
but equally they've also concentrated wealth and power in very few hands. And so, yes, there's a very, uh, you know, there is the upside potential. There are things that, you know, perhaps governments can learn from that, but there are also pitfalls because that power can then be used for good, but it can also be misused. And in a sense, it's not just these large uh, digital giants. As you pointed out, you know, I've been very interested in this notion of frugal innovation, how, you know, increasingly small teams, sometimes our own students in places like Cambridge, can now do things that only large companies or the government could have done 10 or 20 years ago. Using ubiquitous resources and tools, they can develop solutions uh, for quite large numbers of people on a shoestring budget and sometimes just overnight as it were. And, and, and often those solutions are, have a social component to them. They may be in areas that you know, traditionally were in the purview of the government, like in education or health or financial inclusion. So clearly there's a lot of potential here. There's a lot of possibility for what governments can do, but there are also pitfalls. And that's what I tried to look at in the book. I tried to look at how using these new resources, these new technologies and forms of organization, governments might be able to deliver better for their people more efficiently, more effectively, but also how they can balance that against trampling on people's freedoms. How can they balance efficiency uh, effectiveness with freedom. And, you know, so my thesis is that they can do that, but in order to be able to do that, they have to follow some principles. And a lot of the book is about these principles. Some of the principles are about how the government can do its own work and deliver better for its people. And some of the principles are to do with how it can manage the economy, regulate and cultivate the economy. So in terms of doing its own work better, there are three principles. One is, I argue that states need to be more responsive to their citizens. They can do that now with new technologies and organization, putting citizens first and working backwards, outside in from the citizen's problem, rather than inside out from the government's point of view. And I look at that in the context of public services like social care. Then I turn to my second principle, which is how the state can be inclusive, how the state can balance uh, the demands and interests of different groups of people in society. Uh, so I look there at, at social security, for instance, and how new ideas like universal basic income can be used to balance the needs of employers and, the, and companies with that of job seekers. And these ideas are quite new. Theoretically, you know, we could think of benefits, we could also think of disadvantages. So uh, the, it then becomes important, I argue, to test these uh, often in a controlled way. And that leads me to my third principle, which is how the state should be experimental, should try out new ideas, uh, test them ideally in, in pilots where they can minimize the risk of failure, learn from that, iterate, and then scale the solution. So those are the three principles for how the state should do its own work. And then there's a final principle uh, which is concerning how the state should manage the economy, how it should regulate and cultivate the economy, particularly with new technologies coming on board. Uh, and and that's, uh, that principle, I argue, is entrepreneurial. The state needs to be proactive, strategic, needs to take on a risk in the early stage in a calculated way where there may be market failure otherwise, and then transfer the risk to other players, to the private sector and so forth. So, so those, that's, in a sense, the heart of the book. Great. And I wonder if you could just, I mean, one of the strengths of the book is that you, you illustrate your argument with, with really sort of nice cases of, of practice in, in actual governments around the world. I wonder, just before handing over to Richard, if you could illustrate, you know, an example of where it works well. Could you give us one example where you see governments rising to this challenge? Okay, so I'll give you the example. And in fact, the book is full of examples. I tried to argue through the examples and the cases rather than simply, you know, through logic or whatever. Um, so maybe, you know, the first uh, case that I look at in depth is from the country where I grew up, India. Uh, and it concerns the universal ID that the Indian government decided to give all Indians. Uh, and this was a project to give every Indian uh, a unique 11 digit number that would be their ID linked to their biometric information, uh, their 10 fingerprints and the two iris scans. Uh, and they did this uh, in a uh, little under five years um, and with a budget of roughly less than, less than a dollar per person. Um, and uh, it has been transformational. 
so what it has done is it's ensured that all the kinds of payments that the government makes to people, you know, all kinds of benefits, subsidies, et cetera, can go directly to the intended beneficiary. So intended beneficiaries will get what the state owes them or what uh, they have a right to. And it can eliminate all the fraud in the system, all the ghost beneficiaries that many of these systems were full of. And in fact, in the very first year that it was introduced and then used to, for subsidies and so on, it saved the state more than it cost the state. Um, now, of course, so those, that's the upside. Uh, there is you know, uh, this ability of governments, even like the government of India, uh, you know, to be able to do things remarkably fast, uh, frugally, and very innovative and transformational. But there have been pitfalls, which I also look at. There's been concerns around privacy and security. And of course, that's where uh, the judiciary had to step in in some cases. Um, and the Supreme Court in particular, civil society had to step in to ensure that people's freedoms were not compromised. So that's one example, but there are many others. Great, well, that's great. I think it's a nice way to open up the discussion. Uh, but now I want to turn over uh, to, turn to, to Richard to, to, to pick up the conversation. Thank you, Rob, for that. J.D., congratulations. Um, it was, I'm tempted to say it was mad to attempt to take this book on because you've, you are covering such a complex web of sensitive, difficult themes in 289 pages. It was a very ambitious thing to do, but you pulled it off. I find it fascinating. But it leaves me with a lot of questions and I'm gonna end up asking you three questions. Um, as I see it, the context of this book is that governments, that's, I only really know about our government, I, um, are, being, are finding huge waves of change crashing on their shores. At least five, there are the economic challenges. We've had 35 years do dominated by Keynes and um, William Beveridge. Um, and then we had another 35 years-ish dominated by Hayek, Milton Friedman and Margaret Thatcher, which Mr. Blair accepted, except on Europe. And then the crash has pulled the rug out. We've had policies like QE, which I just simply don't understand how it works. Uh, and we now have Mr. Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor's policies on running the economy, which I don't even more don't understand how they work. We're only at the beginning of the story. But the challenges there are huge. There are the technological challenges, which you describe very well, the digitization and, and the potential and the reduction in cost, but also the dark side, which you um, outline in China and elsewhere, where governments can control people's lives and, and intrude in a degree which would have been unthinkable. And that's a huge force for change, which is carrying, has political implications for the development of social media and the ability of people, populist views, which are not rational, but are strongly built on emotion as Trump has demonstrated, um, have much more political sway and political force. And then you have the pandemic, which I think is equivalent now to a, a, a world war. I think the impact on it will be with us for years to come and people will talk about it, but the economic and, and other consequences, some could be positive, but I think there could be some very negative ones. And then there's climate change. Where if the government is serious about the net zero carbon emissions by uh, 2050, will mean phasing out the use of cement, which I didn't know till Julian Orwood told us on the sea something, or phasing out long haul flights, a degree of radicalism which will alter people's lives in ways that people, I don't think governments have got to grips with yet. Uh, and then there's Brexit, which, you know, in its own small way has been overshadowed by a lot of the rest of it, but is actually a complete repositioning of the UK in the world. And we don't know what the policy is about our position. We know what it was not. We know now, we now wait to know what the policy is. Against that background of waves interacting and I think we are in the position, I think every century begins about 20 years in. It, they never begin at the, at, you know, the bit with noughts. Uh, they, and, and I think this century is now beginning. And the question is, it'll be very different from the one we've, I was brought up in and did my career in. Do you think ministers and senior officials need to be much more serious about training? I, I ask that question because you've got a brilliant example of 
uh, of this in, in, when um, a Senate committee cross-examined Mark Zuckerberg and they simply were unable to ask him any good questions because they didn't begin to understand what he did or what his answers meant and he slipped away. And you need, if, you, if governments are going to be playing the role you describe of, 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 uh, of steering but not rowing, uh, they're going to need to be far more, and officials, governments are going to need to be, and local governments, far more astute and knowledgeable. Should we not have proper training courses? Shouldn't it be a requirement for anyone who stands for an MP to go on a training course? I introduced, attempted to introduce training for ministers when I was cabinet secretary. We had a lovely, we had a round of them. They went well. Um, we had a brochure for a whole autumn of training in serious, really important things like IT and, and the economy and so on. And number 10 got to hear about it and asked to see the brochure before we launched it. And I got a message back saying Mr Blair would be very grateful if I would not pursue this initiative because it implied that there were things that ministers did not know. Um, so we never launched it. Um, but I regret it. I think the challenge that is, for, of, I mean, for governments is enormous. And my second question um, is, um, do you think uh, our political institutions are strong enough to cope with the way the world is changing? I mean, people in black tights and wigs coping with social media is quite challenging. Um, and the public attitudes to their representatives are quite challenging. And maybe we should have a, a, an approach to um, parliament, which is different from the one which is, we've had for centuries. I don't know, but people want to be more involved. And that brings me to my third question, which is, do you think we expect too much of government? Do you think that the scale of the challenges, which I've described, is more than any group, smallish group of people can master? And should we, and isn't the, it, you know, the pandemic illustrated the difficulty of doing track and trace on a on a national level. Maybe we should define government's role as being to do only the things that only government can do and do really well. And don't you think uh, we should then, they should provide, government should provide the structure for running a country, but we should have far more decentralization to local levels. That, that opens you to the postcode lottery, but I think we have to face that. And maybe things can only best be dealt with at local levels where people can show initiative. And isn't it, and isn't, shouldn't we stop saying, as you do, that we should, civil servants and public sector should be more entrepreneurial? I think the needs of good, I'll just be provocative now, the needs of good government, good politics, are not always compatible with the needs of good entrepreneurs, risk taking. I can remember, I could give you countless examples of this, but I mean, I remember in, in one case in the Home Office when I was permanent secretary, uh, yeah, we were exhorting people to be risk takers. It was a terrible, we had a whole string of things which I regretted. One of them was a young prison governor who had an India underspend, who had a control problem and he's tried to solve it as an experiment, your word, by install, spending the underspend on all year round football pitches. The idea being that the, the inmates who are keen on football would knacker themselves and there'd be less control problems. And the initial signs were that this was successful. Unfortunately, the tabloid newspapers ran it as a scandal because the local playing field of the schools locally had been sold, whereas the, these inmates were being spoiled with luxury football pitches. And the Home Secretary said to me, I want to sack him. I said, you do not sack him. You, you, you reward him, you give him an OBE or something. He's done what you asked. And on another occasion, I remember, um, I, could, I could go on at length, uh, uh, where, um, okay, I'll stop. Um, but but uh, where a, a minister's reply to me was, I know I wanted them to take risks, but not that risk. Um, I, I think there's a whole area there where the, the, the rewards for taking risks are small and the penalties for getting it wrong are enormous. Okay, three questions, stop now. Well, thank thanks you. Richard, yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, this is not a trivial thing. Um, you've raised many, many reasons why some of the things I talk about in the book are hard to do. Uh, it, it, is, it is hard, um, but these are necessary 
important things to be done. These are important things to be done. I think it was, you know, Kennedy who said, you know, we don't choose to do these things because they're easy. We choose to do them because they're hard. Yeah. And, and, and somebody has to do some of these things. And in fact, some of these things can only be done by governments. You mentioned all these crises, you know, the economic crises of, 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 you know, of the financial crisis, these technological challenges with these few companies becoming immensely powerful. And then, you know, in, in fact, undermining some in sometimes democratic institutions, political institutions, because of the way that their, their, their social media are used by people. Um, you mentioned the pandemic, you know, this huge crisis we're facing now, which is like a world war, climate change, all these things, are obviously, you know, the government can't solve on its own, but there are certain things that here that only the government can do, like coordinating and regulating and getting other parts of the economy to work together. Just let's take the pandemic, for example. I think it's been very interesting how the vaccination program has rolled out. You, your second question is about involving people. I think absolutely we should involve all parts of the economy. The state shouldn't try to do everything on its own. It shouldn't try to row, but it should steer. And some parts, when it's worked very well, uh, the vaccination program has done precisely that. So the state, for instance, you know, you have the third sector, like the universities doing the research, Oxford doing the research, the private sector, AstraZeneca, then figuring out how to do the clinical trials and, you know, um, uh, the testing and all that kind of stuff, and then manufacturing and scaling, and then the government and the NHS being able to actually roll out the vaccination program. So I completely agree on your second point. People need to be involved. Uh, but I, I, I really believe that the government has a very important role. And of course, we have to be clear about what that role is and its approach then to managing the economy and doing its work. And, you know, the first point you made, yes, these challenges are hard. How do we deal with them? I think training is absolutely essential. So I would respond to that first question by saying that I think training is very important. And I, in fact, in one of my chapters, I talk about how in Bangladesh, of all places, a UNDP-led program has transformed. They started as a digital transformation program, but then they realized that that's not enough. It's not just about the technology. You need to change the mindset of people within government. You've got to give them a sense of what's possible, but also to do this from a human perspective. And so there was a lot of training there, empathy training, so that they could look at things from the point of view of the of the citizen and learn you know, what, how they could redesign their services. And of course, then uh, using digital technology became part of coming up with the solution. So I think to answer your first question, training is absolutely essential. And yes, I think perhaps we do expect too much from our governments and perhaps governments themselves take on too much. And which is why, again, I go back to this point about uh, you know, steering and not growing. And I think that it's very important for the government to understand what it can do and it only it can do and must do that well, but equally understand what other parts of the other players in the economy can do. So one of my chapters, you know, you, you mentioned that we shouldn't ask individual civil servants to be entrepreneurial, but the state sometimes has to take on some amount of risk if it wants to, uh, uh, you know, create new industries around new technologies. Because otherwise, uh, no one in the private sector might do that. There might be a kind of market failure. I give the case of autonomous vehicles, where the state in the UK has played a very crucial role by seeding uh, new collaborations between all kinds of disparate players that wouldn't otherwise come together. Universities, software companies, large car companies, small car companies, insurance companies. And the state plays a very crucial role there by going in early, being proactive, being strategic, maybe having some pots of money to get people doing things they wouldn't otherwise do, setting regulations so that these tests, these tests can be done in a, in a relatively safe way. You can have cars driving around on the roads, but without killing people. You can have data and so forth. So I, you know, sort of long uh, response to your question, but basically I think the state is needed even more now. Yes, the state needs to understand what it can do and what it cannot do, and then work with others to do things that others do better. And yes, training again becomes very important, I think, to achieve those aims. Thank you. I mean, Claire. Thank you, Rob, and, and thank you very much, uh, Jaideep. It's 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 brilliant to hear uh, to hear you talking about the book, and it, it's a really really interesting read. So so I had a, I mean a quick reflection on on that last point you were just talking about, and then and then I'm I, I wanted just to dig a little bit into your principles. Um, so I mean on on the on the point about the state, um, it, 
it's very it's fascinating to be reminded how we're bounded by our understanding of the state and I remember doing some reading a few years ago um, going back to I know Beatrice and Sidney Webb and the idea that they had for two entire parliaments uh, one to make laws and one to effectively run public services but also um, the, the, the work of uh, Jane Jacobs, who talks about two syndromes, the guardian syndrome and the commercial syndrome. And sort of broadly speaking, I mean, the guardian syndrome is descended from hunter gatherers and it becomes the public sector. And the commercial syndrome is, is, is descended from early commercial traders and it kind of becomes the private sector, but they get quite mixed up. And, and quite a lot of things that we think of as being quite fundamental to the state and how it works in, in this country uh, are actually things which have been, which are kind of nationalized versions of, of uh, state transactions. But I just want, I'm, I'm, I, I just wanted to explore a bit around the principles um, because you know they're great principles, uh, particularly just thinking about those first three, because you talked a bit about the, the fourth one. Um, and that, that the things that government needs to do. Um, and I mean, I'm, I've long been interested in why things don't turn out the way we think they're going to, um, and why we don't then ask why they don't turn out the way they, the, the way, way they, uh, we, we want them to. And those principles, I mean, they're not, uh, they're unarguable. Um, and I think, you know, and they, they feel like things that government has been trying to do for a while. Interestingly, I think it is in the digital sphere that a bit of progress has been made, partly because uh, because there are specific standards for digital projects that don't exist in other areas. One of the things I uh, was for several years, I was the champion for the Civil Service Digital Award. So I got to see um, submissions from all around the civil service of the fantastic things that people had done with digital. And one of the things that, that was very, very strong every time was the, the thinking about the user experience, standing in the shoes of the user, uh, you know, your first principle about things, making things more responsive. Um, and also, I mean, obviously the digital agenda has gone quite a long way into more experimental ways of working, agile, uh, et cetera. But it's not, you know, it, that's not the way that you wouldn't look at the whole of the government and say that's the way that they, we do business. So I was just I was kind of thinking about the reasons why not. And there are some reasons to do with what government thinks it wants to do isn't necessarily what it does want to do. And that that only becomes revealed when sharp examples come up. Uh, one of one of many many years ago, I was responsible for democratic engagement, um, and it was it was the Tony Blair era, and he was very interested in democratic engagement and made us I think either a, a speech at one point in which he said we are going to give power to the people, um, and, but then it turned out that actually giving power to the people was quite an uncomfortable thing to do, and uh, when digital when um, petitions were introduced and somebody started a petition against road pricing, uh, 1.8 million people signed it, and what they got in return was an email telling them they were wrong. Um, so that sense of we, you know we like it until we're confronted by it and then then we don't. So I think that's part of that's part of why we don't adopt more of this. I think there's a lot of fear around particularly digital transformation. Um, I realised you know it's a word banded about a lot in government, but I realised after a bit that actually every time I heard it, um, I was paralysed with fear, um, and you know lots of other people were paralysed by fear. And actually the most useful thing I did was to start saying I'm paralysed by fear when I hear this, and tried to 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 turn it back into just talking to people about digital is the way we live our lives and digital transformation is no more and no less than changing to keep up with uh, with how we live our lives so so there's a there's an element there of of just kind of fear of things we don't know and then there is there is genuine risk um you know you were talking about small teams uh developing things uh i can remember again in my very early career writing an entire management information system um on a pc that i happened to find lying around in the in the office and then uh, i know and it actually being a genuine risk to the organization because nobody else understood it and, and obviously when you've got lots of people developing things um but you have got to be accountable for the end product and I think you touched on that a little bit with the uh, with the other example so I can see some reasons why things don't aren't happening but I suppose I'm interested firstly in your reflections on those and whether they're things that you found in your examples and what what, what the best way is to overcome them so first of all Claire thank you so much uh, you know for those comments and those questions um, and yes you're, you know you're absolutely right on the entrepreneurial state bit and taking risk and so on uh, again, I think your point sort of reinforced the importance of the state knowing what it can do and what it should do and doing that well, versus what the private sector and citizens and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the third uh, sector can do and do well. And then the state's role, I think, is uh, how to 
steer, as I said, rather than row, how to coordinate, how to bring people together, like we've seen, uh, you know, with the vaccination program or how we saw in response to the financial crisis and so forth. Um, now, coming to your comments about digital transformation and, um, you know, particularly digital in the UK, I think digital government has been a, a success in the UK. And if you look at the rankings, I think the UK comes out at the top of, uh, you know, how, uh, how responsive government is, particularly in the digital realm. Uh, you know, routinely, I think it comes out in the top three or five at least. Um, and I think that's probably because they follow many of these principles that you talked about, you know, the user centricity, uh, agile, small teams, constantly iterating, uh, those kinds of things. And, and I think those are the principles that, you know, I espouse and those are the kinds of things I find work. But you're right that uh, these things can go wrong. And of course, they don't necessarily change the mass of the organization. They might happen at what seems like the margins of the organization. And here in my conversations with people in government, I've been struck by the parallels with my conversations with people in the private sector, in large corporations, because large, large corporations do face similar challenges. Uh, of course, governments are different, and I'll come to that in a second. But you know, large successful organizations, ironically, their success often comes in the way of their continued uh, uh, growth and, 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 and survival even. Um, because you know, having done something well once, they uh, grow, of course, they become big. They then introduce uh, structures and hierarchies. They introduce processes for very good reasons. But then these get in the way of them being responsive and agile and being able to do things in new ways or come up with new things. Um, and so that's the, you know, the challenge. How do you keep doing business as usual and yet move with the times and with technology and so forth? So you see that in the private sector, but of course in government you have that and more because government has hierarchies, it has structures, it has processes, all for very good reasons. And of course it's doing a very important things in a particular way. So it's very hard for government then to also do new things and then introduce those new things which might then clash with its current business as usual. Um, now, how can they solve this? Well, I've been struck and I have some examples in the book by how you see parallels, parallel solutions to this problem in government that you see in the private sector. So for instance, in the private sector, large companies will try and uh, replicate the energy and vitality of startups in-house by creating sort of skunk works, you know, that will be given psychological space and time and so on, and even the permission to fail, um, to experiment. And then if they come up with something that actually works, then the company has to make a decision about whether to really scale that, sometimes at the expense of their existing operations. And of course, that's an element of risk that they have to take. And I see those parallels in government. So one of the examples I give is from the city of Boston where the mayor's office, and actually this goes back to Richard's point, sometimes these insurmountable problems of government are much bigger at the central federal level. They, they're less so when you go lower down in government and you know, particularly when you go to the provincial or the city level. And at the city level, I think the scale is more a human scale and you, you, you know, the pol political challenges and the management issues, there isn't as much of a clash. Perhaps there's more of an alignment there. So for various reasons, I find in my book and my cases that this works better at the city level. So in Boston, the mayor recognizing this challenge of doing business as usual, serving citizens with current, you know, current sort of services and so forth, combining that with trying out new experiments with some of which may work, some of which may not, the, he created a, a separate unit, a kind of skunk works called, given a very elaborate title, uh, you know, uh, it was called Mona, M Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. There's a, there's a Boston reason for that. But this was a small team that uh, was empowered and people were technically savvy, but they were also very entrepreneurial and not necessarily in the sense of taking risk, but in the sense of trying out new things, being open to new ideas, and then both very savvy with things you were talking about, uh, Claire, which is user centricity and agile ways of working. And then the idea was once you've tried those out, you can actually de-risk it by taking failure away from the government department that might otherwise have taken the risk. And so if it fails, then the monum can take the risk and no one actually hears about it. But if they succeed in partnership with the department, then they give the department credit for doing that. You know, so things like this, which big companies have found worked, um, but I see these being replicated in government. 
Great. Well, thank you.